and welcome to today's discussion, Cosmos Above Us and Touch Screen in Front Us. Today's discussion is Silent Media Art Lab launch of Leonardo Art and Science Evenings in Davos, St. Petersburg, in conjunction with the SciFest 13, the theme of Cosmos and Chaos. Thank you, Ars Electronica, for fostering and guiding dialogue what technology means for our life for the past 40 years. The prominent artist, researcher, scientist, and curator Bettina Fuget, Daniela De Paulis, Alexandra Dementiva, Elena Gubanova will discuss the artistic search and interest addressed to the cosmos. The cosmos is full of limitless possibilities for imagination, fantasy. It is deprived from earthly time, biological clocks, and gravitation, and may offer a new realm for cre cre creative invention. Art gives us an opportunity, an opportunity to think about bigger picture ideas and contemplate about them in a new way. Cosmos may inspire artists to question and think differently about who we are, where do we come from, where are we going, and is there anyone else out there? Today's conversation will touch upon the relation between the viewer and the artwork, pushing the boundaries of our senses to explore electroperception and electromagnetic waves. What are the physical, sensorial aspects of artwork? How do we fulfill our need for a tangible experience in the future? What role the materiality of the artwork and physical characteristics of artwork play? What new material cosmos may offer and new ways of thinking about our perception of time and space? Our first presenter, Bettina Fuget, she is a multidisciplinary artist, educator, researcher, director of SETI Institute Artist in Residence program. Bettina's creative process explores the subject of astronomy, astrobiology, science fiction, and feminism. What, what made you decide to tackle these subjects? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, hello, everyone, and I'm so delighted to be part of this uh, talented uh, panel. Looking forward to our discussion. So I am, uh, my life is at the intersection of art and science. Uh, I'm a painter, uh, artist, multidisciplinary artist, but also an amateur astronomer. Because I live downtown Montreal, Canada, um, I often, when I do observing of the night sky, I watch the moon. So if you click on the slide, you will see this beautiful full rotation of the moon because we only ever see one side of it. Uh, this reminds us that we're looking at a globe. And when I look at this globe uh, through my telescope, I notice that all the craters on the moon are actually uh, named after people. But out of the, all of these people, only 1.9% are named after women. Yeah, so you can go uh, one step ahead to the next slide, thank you. <laughs> it's like a little flip. I, I love this animation. Um, so I decided to do something about this underrepresentation of women by highlighting the women and highlighting the problem at the same time. So this is a series of drawings of the 30 moon craters that are named after women. These are a couple of them. So it's graphite and, uh, and black acrylic. This was exhibited both at art galleries and planetariums and was a great point for conversations about the place of women in science. And after the series was finished, I decided to go into 3D printing because I wanted to hold the moon crater in my hand. And also because this uh, series is called Women with Impact, uh, the impact is created when uh, an object hits the lunar surface and makes a void in the regolith. And the regol this void is also stands as a metaphor for the underrepresentation of women in science. So, I had this idea that developed after I started printing, 3D printing these uh, craters that I could do like, you know, a crater is an inny. I could do an outie. I could do a stamp included in a true soul and then walk with it and create moon craters as I'm walking. 
And I decided I should not do this walk on my own. I should invite other women to also go on this walk. Uh, so I'm inviting famous astronomers, female astronomers active in astronomy, astrobiology, also at the SETI Institute, to take meditative walks wearing these shoe soles and to contemplate where we come from, where we're going, where we're going as women, where we're going as humans, and how we are going from the earth to the moon and into the cosmos. And that, that uh, project is called One Small Step. So it's not just one small step for humankind, but also reminding us that it also will be a small step for womankind. Thank you so much, uh, Bettina, for such insightful uh, look into your art processes. Our next presenter is Daniela De Paulus, a former contemporary dancer, transdisciplinary artist, licensed radio operator, and trained radio telescope operator. She is a member of the Permanent International City Committee. Daniela in focuses on digital writing, literature, poetry, performance art, theater, astrology. How did you get into the field and why did you stay? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Natalia, and uh, thanks again to this wonderful panel. I'm also really looking forward to share ideas with all of you. I, um, uh, I think you already framed uh, quite well my, uh, my history. I am a former contemporary dancer, and this really uh, informed my current uh, work. Um, and uh, although the performance background as a dancer is in the background, I think uh, um, people who experience my events, my performances can perceive that I have a special um, interest in how do we embody space and uh, especially uh, in this case the cosmic space. In uh, 2009 I uh, started working with uh, radio technologies which are part of the uh, radio, radio waves are part of the electromagnetic spectrum and this really changed my concept of embodiment which is still very strong in my work but it really led me to uh, conceptualize this um, practice and uh, research in a more philosophical way so I'm particularly interested in how uh, the mind and body dualism um, is somehow uh, really um, an important uh, philosophical aspect of, of uh, how do we uh, understand um, the cosmic uh, space. And uh, you are seeing some of my works from uh, between 2000, 2009 and 2012, in which I used uh, a technology that I developed together with a team of radio operators at the Dwingler Radio Telescope. And um, I called this technology visual moon bounce, which is essentially an innovative development of the a traditional moon bounce technology that is used by radio operators to communicate uh, with the moon uh, via male, mostly voice. And uh, I use this technology in a visual uh, form, uh, sending uh, visualized thoughts into space. And here you see my studio. Uh, the studio has, has really been um, my base for uh, uh, 10 years until 2019 at the Dwingle Radio Telescope, where I also developed this project called uh, Cogito in Space, where I send brainwaves into space, while the participant uh, sees a video of the Earth uh, seen from space. So this, this, this project, I think, really delved into the uh, question of um, uh, embodiment uh, in our perception, understanding of, of, of the cosmos. And, um, the, the, the core of the, of the question is um, how do we make sense of these um, uh, images that we are exposed to on a daily basis of um, exoplanets or other celestial bodies? How do we make sense of it? Is this a, a, a purely intellectual understanding of knowledge or how can we embody these uh, foreign bodies? And how is this creating a new form of perhaps dualism? And um, so this is a, one of the core questions. And here you see also images of um, the performance of Cogito in space in 2019. And I'm now developing this project, uh, moving from the um, uh, human 
uh, brain waves into other uh, sensing beings, uh, our consciousness, our awareness, whatever we would like to call it. So I'm uh, delving into this question of, uh, of consciousness and how do we, um, and the, the extended mind. So how, what is the limit? What is the boundary of uh, our physical presence on earth in the cosmos? Um, and I think this is a, a beautiful image to close the, the blue marble image, the earth seen from space, um, which is the most widely uh, shared image in the history of humankind. Thank you so much for your insightful presentation. Our next speaker is Alexandra Dementieva. She is a multidisciplinary artist and professor at the Royal, Acad uh, the Royal Academy of Arts in Brussels, Belgium. Over 20 years, you're practicing and involved in digital media art. What made you to decide to cuddle this subject? Please tell us a little bit about yourself. Alexandra. Uh, thank you very much for having me on this wonderful panel. I really like to be in this fantastic company. Thank you, Natasha, for your question. So uh, I would like to be sure just to say that uh, Cosmos, in general, it was uh, one of the main uh, point in questioning what people think and what how they involve in uh, this world. So when I was a child, I always uh, was asking myself what the adults are thinking. And uh, also being in a um, family who is scientist family, I'm always trying to explain following some scientific idea of what I am and what is universe. So my idea was, and just really I do remember it when I was small child that I was always thinking it's me, it's room, it's house, it's field, it's uh, Russia, it's planet, it's universe and, and everything in the head of somebody. So for me, this is the idea of the cosmos because we are part of it and this is maybe in the head of uh, some another creature or being. So uh, as I'm always asking question what in other people are thinking, I thought it will be uh, in some moment because I start like a painter, it will be interesting just to go uh, and to start to do something that people will be really involved inside of my installation, inside of my art, that art becomes immersive for them. So um, I began to create interactive installation first with some kinds of very simple things that uh, just uh, changing the uh, view position, like ergonomically, for example, when we're sitting and we see something, and if I will take your chair and put it like uh, in this, like 45 degrees, you will see something else. So uh, already your point of view will be changed. And later uh, I start create much more complicated installation where it was evolved movement, uh, tactile, just video sound that change and following uh, different action. And um, uh, again, I came back to the subject of the cosmos because it was also something that uh, always was part of my life, but not only my life just like a dreamer, but at my life like being a human because like we see the television, we see, we hear the news and after today there is a star from football who will tell us something. So again, okay, star, 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 so just really in constellation. So it means that we are uh, in some sort of the heaven already because we are surrounded by the stars and the different kinds of the personality who are uh, shining to on us well so uh, because of this i also start to thought uh, think about uh, different kinds of the uh, new metaphysic in the world and so uh, suddenly uh, it was clear for me that new metaphysic actually this is the uh, extraterrestrial and artificial intelligent and uh, also the speakers of television, because we see them like also stars and uh, different kinds of their personality that uh, part of our life without really being. So um, after I create several installation links to the subject, now you see the uh, one of the uh, 
uh, installation they have done in Maranula because it's a site specific installation. Here, uh, everything a little bit lighter than it has to be. Normally, I created uh, with the photovoltaic lamp uh, just the constellation for a village, for a small village, and people can adore their own uh, stars uh, composition. Uh, made only for one village because the Italian night is very dark, so you just you see immediately that this triangle appeared uh, for Republic. So uh, I think that uh, this is shortly <laughs> because I can tell a lot of things, but shortly what I would like to say, like introduction. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alexandra. Our next presenter is Yelena Kubanova. She is a multimedia artist curator of Silent Media Art Lab. And since 1990, she has worked in collaboration with Ivan Gvarkov. Gubanova graduated from prestigious Ilya Repin State Academic Institute of Painting, Sculpture, and Architecture. She successfully combines the creative search, the creative search for new media and academical training. She is focusing on digital, urban planning, and built environment. Elena, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, hello. Hello, everybody. My name is Elena, and I'm happy to take part in this uh, great event. Uh, so I live and work in St. Petersburg, and uh, I'm very close to astronomer because my father, he's an astronomer in a great uh, uh, first uh, observatory in, uh, in Russia. Therefore, all my life belong or I live all my life inside of astronomer, you know, and uh, I'm multimedia artist and I'm creator of Silent Media Lab in St. Petersburg, which was founded in 13 years ago to enable artists and engineers to make the joint projects. For five years, I have been the curator of the largest international multimedia festival in Eastern Europe, Cyberfest. So, uh, like Natasha said, I worked together with my husband, artist Ivan Garkov, during 30 years. And uh, of course, uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of time too. And uh, for both of us, we graduated uh, uh, the Fine Art Academy. So very we, were, we are very close to the painting, sculpture, and uh, um, I would say the classical works, uh, classical art. So, and therefore, uh, for me, and a uh, very important question is, is a borderline where the art meets technology. This is a border of the uh, share of the influence and share of the consensus. And what will be the satellite in that story, art or technology? Because uh, both of the part is the, they have, it's have the, the own concept and own rules. So uh, as for us, we express our reflection of, on science and uh, philosophical ideas through the combination of art with engineering solution and technology. This symbiosis uh, for the classical in the modernist sense, image uh, and uh, emotions with technical solution is very important for our works. Uh, for example, in the project Dinei, we combined mythological art, historical history, history, art history, and the uh, wave particular theory of light in a large kinetic object. Golden mirror uh, erotically contract because of the touch of the ray of the light, of light, just as a creation of the world take place in the ancient Greek myth of Princess Dene. It's uh, like a story or like a pictures. It's very close to the Rembrandt um, the picture in Hermitage, the uh, painting Rembrandt. Uh, and we often and we often the inter, uh, do the interactive uh, projects. I think the viewers can understand the meaning of the world only after receiving the emotional impressions from the action. And it is important for me to include the viewers with their mentality and memory in the site-specific installation. And uh, for example, 10 years ago, we made the project Vanya Go Home in uh, the main uh, Pulkova Astronomical Observatory in St. Petersburg. 
We used the largest radio telescope in Russia, not as a technical instrument, but as a powerful symbol of the science and technology. But instead of the expected music of radio signal uh, from the space, the viewer had and had from the um, touching voice of the Ivan's mother, Vanya, go home. Vanya is a short name of Ivan, is my husband. So uh, in this way, we expect, uh, expected simulations, uh, scientific process, and at the same time, uh, created the emotional event of the audience. We combine the scale of the cosmic and the human. And uh, similar to it uh, is the work uh, Redshift, which was the uh, scientific concept uh, of the expansion of the universe, of the universe is used to express the idea of the brevity of the human life. Uh, the installation was designed in such a way as to keep the viewers inside the hall and turn them to, into observers in the red flooded hall of the old Venetian palace we placed video projection dedicated to the astronomical processing as geometric shape. The viewer watched and dissolved in abstract space of painting referring to the Russian avant-garde paint. And uh, it was important that the viewers saw the slow mo movement of the sun, uh, sun spots. And uh, through the spy, they observed, they felt the movement of the earth and sun. So um, I show works which uh, develop the idea that a person cannot constantly think about the expanding universe all, the, all his life, but thanks art uh, is able to feel the global nature uh, of the world in its own life. So. Thank you so much, Helena. Uh, Helena, as one of the curators for Silent Media Art Lab, why did you suggest the theme of Cosmos and House for the 13th SciFest? Oh, uh, uh, we, uh, just a moment, so, uh, just something happened with my, with, with my screen. Wow, wow, wow. Sure. So, uh, no, our international festival of uh, media art SciFest uh, will be held of uh, 13th time in 2021. Of course, an important reason that we have the chosen the name of the next uh, CyberFest, Space and Chaos, is the uh, anniversary of the first uh, manned flight into space by Yuri Gagarin. It will be next uh, year, and uh, we are very glad to celebrate this. And when Gagarin flew around the Earth, people were more, uh, more romantic in relation to space. But now I think the attitude to, to space is now more pragmatic because we know everything about space and uh, we start to close this, uh, uh, this for us because we have no possibility to move uh, far and far and far. And uh, following this uh, theme of the next festival is in, um, inspired by the world of the Greek philosopher Heraclitus. Uh, I like it very much. Uh, uh, the waking have uh, one common cosmos, but the sleeping turn aside into the cosmos of their own. So uh, every time we offer artists about uh, presentation theme, and uh, we, believe, we believe that in contemporary art, almost all works have um, multi, um, multiple meanings. So refresh the great Russian poet Pushkin, <laughs> maybe you know, <laughs> so everything that uh, spends in us with dress conceals enchantment for us. If the cosmos, was founded uh, from the outside, the, that this means that 
uh, that means that uh, uh, is a law to symmetry, chaos should be within us. And the breaking down before, uh, and uh, we see the everything breaking down with our eyes and all areas uh, of human life. And, uh, uh, but you know, but in every chaos, uh, the potential of a new cosmos is always, is always present. That is uh, why we have proposed such a global theme for the artists, so that we can see the uh, viewpoint of this important process and broadly as possible. Thank you, Elena. Uh, Daniela, in your works, you're pushing the limits of materiality to create experiential narratives memories of experience, how does immateriality and physical characteristics of the artwork change the relationship between the artwork and the viewer? And the viewer? How, the, how did it change for the past five years? And what do you predict will happen in the next five or 10 years? Daniel, please. Yes, thanks. This is a really broad question. And um, I think, um, the question of materiality is um, uh, broad and uh, really touches upon also the age of science and art. For example, uh, radio waves, which is the main material, so to speak, in my artworks, are uh, actually ma a, a material tool, uh, despite being invisible. Um, so, um, for the scientists, uh, this is um, uh, a fact that uh, also when we do moon bounce, these radio waves actually touch the surface of the moon and even make a small impact on the moon's surface by heating up the surface uh, for a, a, a um, very short moment of time. Um, so here what we see, I think it's more like uh, a different kind of materiality other than what we are used to see uh, with our uh, senses or perceive with our senses. Um, so indeed, I think this kind of artwork that deals with the invisible uh, attempts to really um, widen the perception of the viewer. So um, I'm suggesting that uh, what is material is not just what is visible, and uh, that our mind is very much limited to um, um, somehow perceive just what our senses are trained by evolution to, to, to perceive for our survival. And yet there is a, a wide uh, sort of matter or not antimatter, whatever we want to call it, that is not perceivable. So how does, um, how can we trust our mind? How much can we trust our mind? And this is really a, one of the questions also I address in my work, uh, which is also um, um, informed by a philosophy of mind and especially Thomas Nagel, uh, who uh, really question how can our mind perceive what is larger than itself? So we have this com compulsory um, 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 need to, to know as humans uh, what is larger than ourselves. And uh, this is very much part of being human. So I try to tackle these questions. And indeed, over the past, I would say, 10 years, my work has become more and more, so to speak, invisible. And as turned more into an experience. So I think for me, what uh, counts the most is to create memories, long lasting memories in the viewer. And um, I am also very inspired by the cosmism, by Solaris, for example, and I, I know we can talk forever about this. So I think I will wrap up the question here and uh, feel free to ask me more later if you wish. Thank you so much, Daniela. Alexandra. Your main focus is the role of the viewer and interaction with the artwork. Your installation provokes the viewer's involvement and allows the hidden mechanisms of human behavior to be revealed. Our communications capacities depends on our perception senses. We can train our senses to expand our world around us. On another hand, we can use the new technological devices which you use in your works to enlarge our sensorial capacities. What is your perception of this new viewer? How do you think it changed in the past five years? And what are your predictions for the next five to 10 years? 
Александра? Sorry. Uh, I would like uh, to say that just I was always interested in technology because technology for me, it was the part of my life and the part of the society where I grew up. So um, I always saw that technology, even if it's sometimes very, very difficult to, to accept, still brought to us a lot of very interesting and very powerful things. And uh, Following now the development, what is happening, uh, I think that uh, our viewer will, uh, will be changing, following what is changing like technological gadget and technological means around. So in my installation, I'm using different sensors. I am using the sensors that it's just a movement sensor, infrared sensor, uh, microphone. I am using a tactical center, but uh now what i see and it's uh, really amazing when you see two years child who is uh, feel very comfortable with the ipod and uh, more or less uh, staying on its own and his or her own being uh, totally independent and uh, normally watching some movie which, uh, so i think that it also this facility with a screen and with different kinds of interaction with the screen and further with the different also devices because this is more and more and uh, for example uh, today i've seen on the internet the amazing chair that uh, permit you to see three screen at the same time to have some sort of the um, uh, keyboard and after to change your position because if you are tied to work like this you just the chair and this is, looks like amazing like some kinds of the film of the alien just go in this position and you're lying and you're watching your three screen around you. So I think that uh, this is a part of our life, of our society, definitely it will change our viewer, our spectator, because they will have different uh, way to perceive because uh, uh, some senses of their, uh, their presence in the world will be enlarged maybe something will be reduced. So just it's again by about physical and material senses, because I don't know if you spend so many times near the computer, so how you feel about another things. And another um, very question that is really coming close and close to us that, uh, for example, the research of Elon Musk about uh, chips that will be integrated in our mind in some way just to enlarge our capacity capacity of memorize things and also just to, to create some sort of the quicker reaction and uh, quicker way of to apprehend the reality and it seems it will be even if uh, half of the population of the earth will say we're against it half of them will be totally agree with it. So just uh, we are human, so we are house. So just because of this, we are never really find the agreement to what to do with this. So I think that uh, viewer and spectator, they will change. Probably we will change too, but it will be interesting to find uh, a new metaphor how we can uh, put our work together and uh, to bring them in this immersive environment. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Uh, Bettina, through your artwork, you disrupt the gender stereotypes. You raise awareness concerning the challenges women have in the STEM, STEM, STEM community. And at the same time, you're empowering the younger generation. What is the biggest challenge in the field in the moment? And about what are the most critical changes that we can make to face the future effectively? That's an excellent question. And I think uh, first, we need to acknowledge that the problem exists. So often I'm hearing a bit of sort of back uh, like um, conversations about, well, it used to be terrible for women in, in the sciences, but it's okay now. And you know what? It's not okay now um, because uh, the women, in, uh, especially in the field of astronomy or any kind of sciences that were deemed to be like very sort of more uh, male dominated, uh, women were like physically shut out. They were not allowed to study, for example, astronomy. They were not allowed to publish or um, submit papers under their own name and had to be male colleagues. Even if they were maybe professors, they were not allowed to uh, earn a salary or they had to quit their jobs once they got married. 
Uh, I remember um, a, a lecture by uh, Jocelyn Bell Burnell, she discovered pulsars and some say robbed of her Nobel Prize, who told uh, the auditorium that when she, she was the only woman studying uh, astrophysics, so this was like 50s, 60s, and whenever she entered the auditorium, all the male students would uh, stand up and whistle until she took her seat. Um, this kind of thing doesn't happen today anymore, but the fact that it did happen kind of echoes through the generations and through time, which means that uh, today, for example, my, you know, does it matter if there's only 1.9% of women memorized on the moon? You know, it's so far away, who cares? But it does matter because it's about representation and there's a recursive relationship between represent like women that we see active in the field and our own desire to join this field. Um, there's this problem of the, what we call the leaky pipeline where girls tend to uh, drop out of sciences because they don't feel it's feminine or that they're not good at it. It's, so that's, that is called stereotype threat. And it's not because of abilities. Tests show that girls and boys do equally well in science. It's all about um, perception, gender stereotypes. So I think as an artist, you can play a role there. And I think this is one of the wonderful intersections of art and science that we can come in to this field and offer a critique. And critique doesn't always need to be negative. I'm not pointing a finger and saying like, you know, the IOU purposely uh, sort of, you know, edits out 97% of women. That is not true. It's just because of um, the way history works and the historical canon is constructed that that is an outcome and that that outcome needs to be addressed. So I think as artists, we can do that. And I see all the other women and like in, in your own way, you all sort of offer critique or different awareness about something that is happening in the sciences. So I'm hoping that there's a positive effect and showing these works like the Women with Impact series is really lovely, especially at the planetarium because people don't come in there for art. They're going like, oh, contemporary art's not for us. They're just going there to you know, watch the moon and the sky show. And they're seeing artworks and I'm getting like texts and, and Instagram messages like, this was so great. Like, you know, we took our girls there and girls text me, it's like, this is amazing. So I can see that there's an impact, impact again. And then uh, doing the um, One Small Step project I'm getting the actual women involved. Now they are making art, right? So this is more of an intersection of art and science. And it kind of uh, tucks into what Daniela was also saying, uh, saying about being embodied, right? So I'm distributing the um, artistic experience away from me as artists and also letting other people be co-creators and experience something. So they're walking, it's a meditative walk. You're, you know, you're making impacts yourself and um, so you, so it's reflective and ideally I would have everybody in the world have one of those shoe soles and they can go on, on their own walks and make moon craters. I love that Daniela has radio waves make little impacts on the moon. That's, that's another woman making an impact. Uh, and that is all women here talking about the cosmos. So I think the more we are foregrounding these conversations, we can sort of shift the needle slightly peu a peu until we get into a place where, um, uh, there's more equity in, in the field of science overall. And, and basically, like I said, let's acknowledge that the problem exists. Thank you so, thank you so much, Bettina. Uh, Ilya Kapakov in conversation with Anthony, Anthony Hagen Guest said, whoever said that sitting at home for three months is boring, just opposite, endless possibilities. You can finally meet the person you never had time to meet before, yourself. A COVID-19 pandemic isolation, return to physical work, change, change us all. What is the biggest challenge in your art process at the moment, uh, Bettina? What's the, oh. biggest, what's the biggest challenge in the moonwalking? The, well, the moonwalking was supposed to be a documentary. I was mm -hmm. gonna go and, and film these women going on their walks. And now I can't travel. It's like, ah, oh, this, this is a major snag, right? So, but actually it forced me to reinvent the project and saying like, I don't need to be there. 
these are smart women. Scientists may not be trained cinematographers, but isn't it wonderful that by their own way of documenting and reflecting, it, it involves them much more in the, in the art project. So by, um, by sort of instigating these meditative walks and having uh, sort of these astronomers turn into artists, I think the project actually got better. So I'm so, thank you, thank you, Virus. Um, <laughs> this is now a better art project. So um, I think as artists, we are especially well equipped to deal with speed bumps, hurdles, and uncertainty, because that's, you know, that is where we live. We live with uncertainty. If you're not uncertain, you're not being creative, because then you're just repeating something that you've done before. And I think even cutting edge scientists are there as well, especially at the SETI Institute, where you're looking for alien life, and you're looking for something, you have no idea what that is. You, you're searching for something you can't conceive of. So they're also actually very creative and live with uncertainty. So again, there's a, you know, there's a nice intersection that's happening there as well. So that is something that we can exploit in this time and so reinvent ourselves and, and maybe meet ourselves. I, I really love that quote. Thank you, Bettina. And Daniela, what, what it was like for you, for your art processes? How did it change? Uh, how did it change your art making and art thinking? I couldn't agree more with the Bettina. Pretty much everything you said, Bettina. Actually, I completely echo your uh, thoughts. Uh, also, sorry if I make a step back, but also about uh, female representation in general in the intellectual field, not only in mm -hmm. science, but in general. I feel like uh, there is a bias towards intellectual output from women, and uh, I'm pleased that all of us here in this panel we are really uh, fighting to challenge that. Um, indeed, I think also as artists, we seem to thrive uh, when there are difficulties or uh, moments of uh, uncertainties. And for me, this also was a very interesting period uh, when I finally explored some of the ideas I had at the back of my mind for years. And um, I started a new project that uh, I also described in the paper uh, for the SciFest, and um, so I really uh, took uh, some, some of the ideas that were dispersed in my mind. I, I finally uh, created a thread, uh, a thread for these ideas and, uh, and uh, channeling them out uh, and uh, making them happen uh, remotely, because indeed you can do a lot uh, nowadays just uh, virtually. And I think this also is very much connected with the way I work um, which is um, in general using the global community and also exploring the possibilities of um, collaborating with people, um, involving them directly, just like uh, Bettina. Um, so it is really creating, I think, for all of us, uh, great opportunities to work on a global scale. And I see this happening a lot in, uh, in this community, Leonardo community, uh, the amazing uh, amount of activities that they've been organizing over the past few months to bring the art and science community together. I think that's a great example for all of us to uh, see how much uh, more we can get to know each other. And I've, I've met uh, a lot of artists uh, directly thanks to this pandemic. Uh, I've never had the opportunity to talk to them. And finally, here it is, a window to the world um, thanks to technology and the willingness of people to keep being social and share um, ideas, culture and everything. Thank you so much, Daniela. And Alexandra, how did it challenge or inspire your art processes? This isolation well, pandemic and coming back to the physical world. Well, actually, I was uh, quite inspired, honestly, and just I can join uh, Bettina and Daniel because I have uh, suddenly a lot of time. Uh, secondly, being always thinking about cosmos, I some moment I do understand immediately that I'm probably in uh, some spaceship going somewhere, but I'm alone, but I still can communicate so suddenly. And it's true, my communication, it, it was much more intense than normally because uh, it's not only because of me, but some people calling, asking. Uh, so 
so it gives me a possibility really to study a microorganism that I didn't have really time and uh, because I'm watching already for two years uh, tardigrad and this is my favorite animal and just I would like to have them like like my home animal but they always exca escaping when I have them so even if I'm trying to look on them constantly at some moment when I arrive they are not there anymore so it uh, really gave me a possibility that I never could uh, give this time and especially reading, reading because I'm traveling a lot and I'm traveling with installation and traveling with installation, it means that I am not only bringing installation, but I mounting the installation for to be sure that everything is working and that only uh, last uh, five, six years it's possible to have uh, technical support really on the place because otherwise you arrive and after, uh, I remember it was a long time ago <clears throat> in Brazil, I was mounting my installation. It was like a team of men looking at me. So just, uh, and after one of them, like 15 minutes arrived and said, it's you who have done it. <laughs> yes, this is, this is uh, some kinds of the uh, story, you know, it's, uh, so um, I stopped travel and I found myself home and I had a lot of time just like a, a bit in a your moon is fantastic because I always constantly make a photo of it and I'm very jealous to have all this around because I cannot do it but maybe next step it will be because I'm well prepared to go to the space in a spaceship even maybe alone so it was practically very very interesting period and uh, yeah. Thank you, Alexandra. And Yelena, how did it influence uh, your process? I know that Silent Media Art Lab initiated special video series like 101 Working Insulation. Yelena? Uh, thank you, Natalia. Yes, yes, you're right. Uh, we organized the uh, video program and we invited artists to take part in this uh, in this program all of all, our friends and uh, artists from Russia and artists abroad and uh, international project and they send us very interesting short video how they spend this uh, uh, time uh, along in the studio or in the da summer house you know that uh, many Russian artists have some summer houses very 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 famous spend time to in Russia to to in the garden to grow some vegetables and to keeping to handle mushrooms and so it's very very interesting projects was and uh, but as for me the, I tried to to be observer inside in my home and uh, I <laughs> I observe time to time and step by step I observe, I observe the, every, everything in my inside of my home so inside my myself and uh, I made some small video how to observe the moving earth and uh, through the sun uh, if you lie on the sofa so it's, uh, <laughs> it's very it's only uh, one screen with a cap it and uh, moving the sun, the sun uh, sports through this carpet all day so you can lie and to be in you know in cosmos so like something like that and um, our audience is um, asking a question isn't also the space encompasses uncertainty is this where the door open for the artist does it open uh, uh, the door for the artist and uh, so our relationship where in space you just one-on-one -on -one so how, how does how does it um, open the door for the artist? Uh, you, it's it's uh, for me questions. Uh, I'm sorry. Or okay. anyone who would like to respond, uh, uh, Daniela. Yes, I think the first uh, word I quote is uh, space. Uh, I think space. it's uh, very subjective. The space and uncertainty. So the yes, I I think uh, the core uh, element for me here is uh, the word space uh, because I think it's uh, the perception of space is very subjective. So uh, what, for example, for me, space also involves cosmic space. I see no particular division or boundary between myself and cosmic space. Uh, I think this is a, a word that for every person uh, means space and uncertainty. Sp yes, space and uncertainty. 
So and I think indeed, poetically, space of course includes uncertainty. And I think, again, uh, these are really uh, space and uncertainty is really something that applies subjectively. And I think um, it's a really a, a very uh, interesting ground for, for artists in general. Uh, Bettina, would you like to add something to the uncertainty of the space? Yes, uh, it's, this is a very good question. And I think there's a little echo. We talked uh, uh, earlier about um, space exploration used to be such a positive thing. We, you know, we were all like, in the, in the, when we were in the space race, it was a utopia and now it's become more of a dystopia um, because of this so uncertain. We don't know what we're going to find up there. We don't know, like, you know, like I said about aliens, you know, what is even, what, what, what is even a life form? We don't even know uh, on earth how we define life really. Um, is it carbon-based? It, it could not be. So everything, as soon as you step off this planet, everything becomes uncertain. And yes, absolutely. I think we need imagination because if you don't have good imagination, you can't ask interesting research questions. So um, the really interesting scientists, they are a little bit like artists because they need to go like, what, what is the thing that I haven't thought of? Especially if we're thinking about space, we cannot be anthropocentric. We cannot always go like, well, aliens obviously have like, you know, two arms and, and they have eyes. You know, it was fun about um, looking at uh, radio waves as this is completely outside our spectrum, but maybe another life form only functions in that space. So we need to um, sort of get, get out of ourselves and imagine ourselves like in space, different gravities, different temperatures. Uh, this is really an artist's job. So you guys need us, you scientists. And Alexandra, your thoughts on uncertainty and the space? Well, actually I like the idea of uncertainty because uh, again, just like to join, it's uh, very creative. Because if you have so many questions, you look for an answer and you look for an answer. And this is a process that also become very powerful because in this case, if you will find the right answer, so just uh, after it will be another question, but it will be some sort of the uh, overcoming some kinds of the obstacles. And uh, I like the idea that we will meet uh, maybe one day somebody uh, intelligence that uh, will will uh, be able to communicate with us but in the same time i think uh, maybe we will not but the space itself it's uh, just for explanation and i'm sure that uh, one day we will be very very far and we we will continue feeling us to be the part of this universe because just uh, all these elements that we are constructed from this is the universe. So just maybe one day we will be disintegrated in a small part of molecule and after reintegrated some another planet, but like a uh, thousand sounds and uh, light years from us. So who knows? Yeah. And um, to everyone, uh, maybe to Bettina, if there is one idea with the, which, which you would share with the audience today, What's the mo most, what is the most important to remember about what we discussed? If it's just one idea. Any, uh, uh, Daniela? If well, uh, one idea, what's the uh, most important to remember about today's discussion? One we need to be physical. I mean, it's like uh, to, to, to keep uh, thriving as humans. Um, is it necessary to, to be always in the presence of each other? Or how can we explore that uh, loss, temporary loss, in a creative, exciting way? Anyone else about one idea? Just one idea, one final thought? I'm thinking maybe of uh, networking. We, we're more distributed right now. We are more global, we're more connected, even though we're alone, we're together. And uh, I think that is also a lovely thing maybe to contemplate. Thank you so much. And uh, I, I, yes. think, I think we can keep our romantic uh, viewer to the cosmic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. 
Stay and now we, we have more time to look out, to look at the stars and uh, yeah. connect yeah, right. individually right. with the sky. In, in Russian, especially in August time, in August night, it's fantastic. It's uh, incredible. Thank you so much, uh, Bettina Foget, uh, Daniela De Paulus, Alexandra Dementieva, and Elena Gobanova for sharing your thoughts and perspective on your art practices with us today. Thank you also Ars Electronica and Leonardo Laser Talks and Silent Media Art Lab for fostering today's conversation on cosmos and cows. So thank you the audience for your questions and your attention. So let's continue the conversation in February, 2021 when Leonardo Journal is planning to publish the special issue devoted to the theme of cosmos and cows prepared in collaboration with the International Festival SciFest. And in addition to the essays by today panelists, it will also feature the materials from artists, scientists, thinkers, curators, art historians, who practice with innovative art, scientific research, and the presentation of the cosmos in our culture and society.